Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hey everyone, welcome. I'm Susan Kaufman. I'm here for Attitude's weekly ADHD experts broadcast. And this is the first of Attitude's 2019 expert webinars. We have a great schedule lined up for this year. I think you're going to learn a huge amount, as we always do. And just before we start, I wanted to remind you that you may replay any of last year's webinars on the Attitude website at attitudemag.com slash webinars or download them in podcast format from the Attitude website from Stitcher or from iTunes. Today, I'd like to thank Accentrate, the sponsor of today's webinar, Accentrate is a new nutritional supplement that's specifically formulated to address many of the nutritional deficiencies known to be associated with ADHD. To learn more about it, go to the Accentrate website. It's www.accentrate.com. So thank you, Accentrate. Our speaker today is Dr. James Greenblatt, who will be discussing how you can develop an integrative plan to treat ADHD for both adults and children using trace minerals and plant extracts. He's a pioneer in the field of integrative psychiatry. He's treated patients with complex behavior and mood disorders since 1990 and specializes specifically in integrative medicine for ADHD, developing individually tailored nutritional supplement plans for his patients. He's chief medical officer and vice president of medical services in Waltham, Massachusetts, and on the clinical faculty at Tufts Medical School and Dartmouth School of Medicine. He's the author of, and you're going to want to check out this book if you're interested in what he's talking about. It's called Finally Focused, the Breakthrough Natural Treatment Plan for ADHD. Dr. Greenblatt, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Great, thank you. And uh, this probably goes back to uh, 1990 uh, when I came out of uh, psychiatry uh, training and I had patients, let's say parents, walk in and say, please um, medicate my child for ADHD. And I had other parents screaming at me and the child and everybody in between that there's no way my child will take the medication. And um, it's been over 30 uh, years that I've been practicing child psychiatry. Uh, the word and the term that I use is integrative medicine, integrative psychiatry. And I'd like to share a little bit about the treatment of ADHD uh, as an integrative um, physician. Um, Many of you are kind of aware of the 100-year evolution of this disorder. We change the name every 10 or 20 years, and this just reflects to me how poorly we really understood ADHD um, from a brain damage, and then I think we felt bad for the kids, and then we said, okay, the minimal brain damage, with or without hyperactivity, it kept going on and on. Um, but I do believe that we now understand ADHD as a neurobiological um, illness, and um, it's much easier to uh, discuss and do research and talk about in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, Finally Focused is, is the book that uh, we wrote a couple years ago on an integrative approach to ADHD, and we kind of use this uh, plus-minus plan because too many of us will read something in a magazine or talk to our neighbor, and they recommend a vitamin, a supplement. We try it. It doesn't work uh, without a real thoughtful um, medical approach. So the plus-minus plan just says there are some things in our environment, whether it's pesticide or chemicals or gluten, if we have celiac disease, that we need to avoid. And there's some individuals that are deficient, um, and that's the plus. So the plus-minus plan is the hallmark of our ADHD diagnosis. And here's some of the uh, things that we discuss in the book. For our presentation today, we're just going to focus on a few, um, mostly uh, OPCs, uh, magnesium, copper, and zinc. So nutritional psychiatry Uh, It's been my career for 30 years. I think it's one of the most overlooked fields in in medicine by conventional doctors. The brain is the most metabolically active organ in the body, Uh, 25% of our metabolism. So deficiency in any nutrient is going to affect brain function. And what we're now understanding is genetic differences in nutrient needs. And 
I believe part of the genetics of ADHD is how we um, metabolize and utilize nutrients like magnesium, zinc, and likely folate. So today we were going to just pick uh, one of these topics to focus on, or a few of these topics, but OPCs uh, is the most interesting and fun for me. Uh, don't ask me to say it. I'll try to say it once, oligomeric proanthocyanidins, um, but we'll just call it OPCs. These are chemicals. These are the um, called the polyphenols in, in plants and fruits and vegetables, and it's those dark, beautiful colors, so the blue and blueberry, the green and grapes, green tea and the dark chocolate. Um, so they're highly concentrated sources of phytochemicals. And when I um, went into practice, there was a lot written about OPCs. So this book uh, by Jean Carper, who was a, a, a journalist, science journalist, uh, her book on miracle cures, one of these chapters was on OPC and ADHD. And then this uh, review uh, keeps publishing OPC as a miracle antioxidant. So I'm going to take you on my journey that started in the um, suburb of Boston in uh, 1993 on using OPCs. Uh, but first, we need to do a little neurochemistry and uh, understand some brainwave uh, terms. So most of you might have heard the term alpha waves. Anybody who's doing their meditation or yoga uh, producing alpha waves. Those are those relaxing brain waves. Anybody who's paying attention um, is utilizing beta waves. Those are these uh, bottom waves there. You see those short, um, fast brain waves. So if you're paying attention, beta waves. If your child or if you're paying attention in school, you're using beta waves. And then those big daydreaming brain waves up above, you see the theta waves. Those are the daydreaming brain waves. Okay? So we have research going back many, many years looking at ADHD. We'll talk about neurofeedback in a minute, which is based on this um, research, that those individuals with ADHD have increased theta waves, these higher slow wave activity, increased theta waves. And they have decreased beta waves. Makes sense. We did uh, EEGs in my office for many, many years in the 90s, and we saw this every single day. And so we have good research, academic research, published research in the scientific journals showing that this ratio, this increased theta to beta ratio, daydreaming brain waves to paying attention brain waves, is uh, abnormal in the kids with ADHD. So it's that increased theta to beta ratio, which is some research uh, points to it as a diagnostic tool for ADHD. And, and that was the premise for a lot of the neurofeedback. I'm sure many of you have heard of neurofeedback. It is biofeedback for the brain where we're teaching kids and adults how to do two things, right? To decrease the theta waves, and increase beta waves. So neurofeedback teaches the brain, and it works um, incredibly well, teaches the brain how to decrease theta and increase beta. And the research here, there are four studies as effective as Ritalin, um, follow-up six months, the neurofeedback group, um, quicker and greater improvement and it was sustained. So if we train the brain with neurofeedback, we can see sustained improvement. So in our office in the 90s, we did research um, looking at these OPC uh, supplements. Um, and I just want to quickly share with you some of these graphs. You can just remember the dark blue is the theta. So that's the uh, not paying attention brain waves, right, the theta waves. And the gray is the beta. So then we gave these um, individuals OPCs. This is a 13-year-old boy. And you see a dramatic decrease in daydreaming brain waves. And let me do, here's the original old study. You can see it. Um, so red here is the theta wave. We gave them these extracts of grape seed, of blueberry, green tea, and we dramatically decreased 
the theta wave, so they paid attention better. And it's consistent with the research that we have with neurofeedback. So here's the issue. We know that this theta-beta ratio is predictive of ADHD, and it is predictive across the lifespan, right? High theta, not paying attention. And we know if we improve that theta-beta ratio, they're going to focus better. We can do that two ways. You can do neurofeedback, which I actually stopped using it in the office because of the expense um, at the time. Insurance now covers a bit of it, but when we, we did it, insurance wasn't covering it. It was hard to predict who would do better, and it was thousands of dollars that parents would need to pay. But it does work, and it does help with the right um, uh, trainer. But what we're also able to show is that OPCs, these supplements were able to decrease that theta-beta ratio. And remember those books um, written in the 90s, The Miracle Cure and The Miracle Antioxidants, were based on this um, information. So, again, OPCs are these phytochemicals find naturally. Um, in my experience, eating a few blueberries um, is probably not sufficient to treat our kids with ADHD. So we're looking at concentrated uh, supplement sources of these OPCs to affect attention. And this was a, a study published a few years ago looking at um, blueberry extract uh, compared to placebo. So blueberries being a very concentrated um, source of OPCs. And here we have um, increased activation in, in brain areas based on uh, both cognitive te tests and uh, MRIs on a memory and executive function, um, increased blood flow and improvement in working memory. So blueberry extract versus placebo. There's lots of other studies looking at uh, OPCs um, affect attention, memory, and brain function. The uh, literature on cognitive decline is um, uh, growing uh, exponentially around some of the um, OPC supplements of green tea, grapeseed extract, uh, ginkgo, uh, all very concentrated sources of uh, OPCs. So that was the first phytochemical I wanted to share with you uh, today. And then I uh, need to talk a little bit about um, our, our water, or at least the water that our kids are drinking in schools. Um, you know, the Flint, Michigan uh, crisis kind of woke us up to um, the concern about lead pipes and water in the pipes. And this is actually a picture of um, the water in Flint. And what um, was not as clear is um, the other kind of chemicals in water that is uh, affecting the behavior. So lead uh, has, has profound implications for brain function and implications for ADHD. Every child should be tested for lead um, and retested. It's routine in our young children, but we've um, detected lead in four, five, and seven-year-olds who have not been um, tested for many years. So lead is a problem that at least our medical colleagues and our public health officials are aware of that. What is less concerning but much more prevalent in my experience is copper. Copper is, is contaminating our water supplies and it's mostly affecting our young children. This was a study in Massachusetts where I live looking at 1,000 uh, schools. And, and not only did they find high lead, this is higher um, than what is considered safe in over 900 schools, but uh, 265 had elevated copper. So copper is one of the more common uh, toxic nutrients that we see in our ADHD kids. Copper is required to the synthesis of dopamine, the neurotransmitter, um, and norepinephrine that are affecting uh, attention and focus and executive functioning, and, and too much copper uh, also is a risk factor for those individuals that don't respond as well to stimulants. <clears throat> High copper is typically found in kids that are irritable, aggressive, and poor response to stimulants. The consequence of high copper 
is something you probably heard more about, is this zinc-copper balance. And there's been literature since the 90s by traditional psychiatrists on the relationship between zinc, uh, particularly low zinc, and ADHD. Much of this is due to high copper, um, that seesaw of zinc and copper. When a copper goes up, zinc goes down. And uh, when zinc is, uh, someone takes too much zinc, copper goes down. Both are, are critically um, uh, important and need to be balanced. High copper in the water is common. Um, a new studies actually came out in Massachusetts looking at more schools. Uh, lead is not the only concern. But what we have is if copper is elevated, we have this deficiency in this trace mineral called zinc. And, and zinc is incredibly important for many, many parts of brain function, how the brain is structured, how the enzymes in the brain work, how memory works and how the neurotransmitters associated with ADHD work. Specifically for ADHD, over the years, we have very good research looking at if zinc levels are low, uh, there's poor response to a stimulant. If you took 100 kids with ADHD um, and 100 kids that were not, those with ADHD have lower zinc. And then there were some trials of zinc um, instead of supplements, where a zinc was effective as a supplement. And then we have research looking at some of the behaviors of ADHD. So zinc has um, been a uh, very important nutrient that's been studied for probably 15 years now. There's just one study looking at um, 45 kids. This was published in a, a Korean journal of uh, child psychiatry. Uh, what I have found in uh, focusing on nutrition and ADHD is that a lot of the better research on nutrients and behavior is actually done in different countries around the world. So we have studies um, uh, from academic centers in Russia, in Egypt, in Korea, in Germany, um, some from the States, but there's a much more open uh, communication between a traditional medicine and nutritional deficiencies in other countries. Anyways, here looking at hair concentrations of zinc um, and zinc concentrations negatively correlated with ADHD rating scales. Another study done a couple of years ago looking at uh, zinc augmentation. So these are individuals who were taking um, stimulants and they got either zinc or placebo. Um, this one with uh, fish oil as well, and there was improvement in the uh, ADHD rating scales uh, measured from zero to eight weeks. So zinc augmentation is a, is an important part of the plus-minus plan. The plus is adding zinc. The minus is, is monitoring copper, and if copper is elevated, then uh, supplementation with zinc. Uh, the next mineral that... Um, we're going to talk about that this afternoon is magnesium. In our plus-minus plan, we put magnesium as the first chapter, and it's one of the few nutrients in my practice covering all psychiatric illnesses where I would make a statement that everybody who has ADHD could benefit from magnesium. Um, and the few that don't, it, uh, there's no side effects or concerns. Um, we've been astonished over the years, 30-plus years of testing. The vast majority of kids and adults are deficient in magnesium. Magnesium, um, well, we'll get to that. This is just one study um, done a number of years ago. 95% um, of those children um, aged 9 to 12 had a deficiency in magnesium. It's very hard to assess magnesium. We can go to our doctor and say, can you check me for vitamin D? And we can do a blood test and have pretty accurate representation of that. Uh, we do a little, we can do okay with zinc. We certainly can check for heavy metals like copper and lead. But magnesium, we cannot do a blood test because 99% of the magnesium is in our cells, in our bones, in our tissues. So blood test is not accurate. 
Um, so we need to look at clinical symptoms, and, and I'll get to some of that um, in, in a few minutes, but clinical symptoms is important in trying to assess magnesium deficiency. Um, besides my theory, although I have no scientific proof, I do believe our kids and adults with ADHD probably have a genetic need for higher magnesium, but there are certainly environmental things that interfere with magnesium, stress being the most common as our stress level goes up, as cortisol levels increase, our magnesium decreases, so we deplete magnesium. Soft drinks. Soft drinks are filled with uh, phosphoric acid. So phosphorus goes up and magnesium goes down. There's a uh, doctor in Germany who treats ADHD on a low phosphorus diet, just eliminating sources of phosphorus. Caffeine, alcohol, and, and multiple medications interfere with magnesium. Uh, Magnesium-rich foods are our whole grains, our green leafy vegetables, nuts and seeds, and these were um, one study, a uh, public health study in 2015, um, those individuals that had the highest intake of magnesium-rich foods had least likely to have symptoms of hyperactivity. Um, a, a review um, it's called a systemic review, six intervention um, of magnesium supplements, um, looking, again, here's Iranian medicine, magnesium effective for the treatment of ADHD. Uh, this was uh, an older study, one of the um, uh, kind of regional studies looking at magnesium supplements, 50 kids for six months, uh, 200 milligrams, decrease in hyperactivity compared to baseline in all the um, hyperactivity scales looked at. Uh, the dosaging we'll talk about, this was 200 milligrams uh, per day for six months for kids age seven to 12. There's another study that looked at other nutrients, um, 810 kids. Here was a, uh, a supplement with magnesium, zinc, omega-3s, um, which also demonstrated a, a decrease in uh, ADHD symptoms, and improvement in falling asleep. One of the ways that we assess the clinical uh, deficiencies of magnesium is looking for uh, insomnia or difficulty sleeping. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And here's um, what I meant about, you know, studies all around the world. This was um, from a small country, time in Russia, but uh, looking at nutritional uh, deficiencies in ADHD. Um, they were able to demonstrate magnesium and vitamin B6 and positive EEG changes and improvement in behavior. So magnesium is probably the most common nutritional deficiency that we see in ADHD. It's, again, one of the few supplements that I can say it is safe for every child and adult to try. And some of the clinical symptoms that you would look at. Uh, magnesium deficiency results in constipation, irritability, anxiety, and insomnia. So if you or your child has any of those, usually individuals have two, three, or four, uh, magnesium is likely to be helpful. We use between two to 400 milligrams a day of magnesium. As I said, serum levels aren't helpful but you can look at something called an, a red blood cell magnesium that can be helpful. And we also sometimes look at hair levels of magnesium that also can be helpful. Um, again, constipation, irritability, anxiety, insomnia. I'm sure all those sound familiar. As you start to look at magnesium supplementation, you'll see improvement in constipation first, then irritability, um, and within a few weeks to a month, Usually, a sleep improves dramatically. I mentioned this before. Um, it's hard to test. And, and this is where I wanted to kind of focus for a few minutes. Um, how do you know what magnesium supplements to use? Well, the, the truth is any supplement is fine, although I would not use magnesium oxide. If you walk through the drugstore, uh, magnesium oxide is primarily found in the laxative aisle milk and magnesia, and any other, other laxatives. So 80 to 90% of magnesium oxide is not absorbed. 
so it acts as a laxative. Any of the other forms of magnesium, citrate, gluconate, glycinate, threonate, are all appropriate. Every a supplement company might argue one is better than the other. Uh, clinically, I, I think they're all good and they're the same. You do not want to give them um, magnesium all at once. You want to split it up. And the only side effect you need to worry about is loose stool. Again, it's a laxative. So some individuals um, might have a, a loose stools, which means you want to decrease the dose or switch to a different form. So today I just wanted to summarize some of the nutritional deficiencies uh, that we see in ADHD, all supported by many, many years of research around the world. And uh, we talked a little bit about zinc deficiency. Most of the time it's related to copper, high copper in the environment, in our water supply um, that creates this uh, zinc deficiency. Zinc is also found in mostly bioavailable in animal products. So if uh, a vegan, vegetarian adolescent starts to get worse, um, oftentimes dietary intake of zinc is not adequate. We've also seen exacerbation of symptoms in individuals that have gone uh, to the, the hot yoga, forget what that's called, but where they're sweating, you lose zinc through your sweat. So I've had an individual did quite well for a while as an adolescent started, uh, turned into a, a vegan diet, doing the, the sweat yoga three times a week, and within three months, uh, symptoms got worse. I saw them about six months later, and they were really struggling with attentional uh, symptoms and were found to have profound zinc deficiency. Adolescence is one of the few times where we have a higher need for zinc, uh, similar to pregnancy. So we have to be really cautious of our kids or our spouses or our friends that go on a vegan vegetarian diet without adequate zinc and B12. I also mentioned magnesium um, and the most common nutritional deficiency. Iron and ferritin I did not talk about. That's also common, uh, poorly um, assessed in our ADHD kids. Sometimes we might look at iron in our uh, adolescent uh, women, but we're not checking it in men and boys. And uh, there's a very, very strong literature of iron deficiency anemia in both infants, children, adolescents, and adults associated with attention and ADHD. And then lithium is a big part of the work that I do as an integrative psychiatrist. Um, lithium, many of you think of as a, a pharmaceutical, uh, but it's actually a nutrient. It's a central mineral uh, in the soil that is required for brain function. And the research over the past um, uh, many years, uh, since the 80s, have demonstrated uh, communities that have low levels of lithium in the drinking water have more behavior problems, uh, irritability, aggression, depression, even suicide. What we have found in our ADHD work is that those uh, subset of individuals with ADHD that are more irritable, more aggressive, poor impulse control, and a family history of substance abuse or mood disorders tend to be deficient in lithium. So we're, we're looking at very, very small um, micro doses of nutritional lithium for our ADHD kids to support improvement in those behaviors. So this is um, one of the uh, big uh, studies done by uh, Dr. Galler, who at the time was at Boston University. Now she's at uh, Harvard Medical School, and she's a, a pediatrician that followed individuals for 40 years. So it's very rare in nutrition research or any research that we can follow people for 40 years. And, and what she did is that she was studying the relationship between malnutrition and ADHD. So she had individuals in this small island in the 60s that went to a physician, a doctor's office or hospital for uh, an episode of malnutrition in the first year of life, okay? First year of life. And then they were repeated and they were monitored um, for the 40 years following that. So 40 years. 
and their nutritional status were, was monitored um, for those uh, 12 years. And here we have 80 adults uh, with a history of malnutrition and 63 controls. And the numbers are, are quite staggering. 60% of the malnourished kids had symptoms of ADHD. Think about that for a minute. 60% of the kids with malnutrition had ADHD. And, and this is just dramatic. And when she um, looked at the studies and, and they, she published work uh, throughout the um, study um, and the rates of ADHD just increased and, and compared to norms in Barbados or in any other country, they would just dramatically increase. So it was just a, a very a powerful example of how a one episode of, of malnutrition can affect brain function and result in, in symptoms of ADHD. So I want to make sure I leave time for questions. But, you know, to, to summarize, I've been practicing psychiatry for 30 years, child psychiatrist, focusing on ADHD. And the drugs or no drugs, to me, is really never the question. You know, the question is, how can we support a, a child functioning better and working up to their potential? As an integrative psychiatrist, I use medications when needed, but if there are nutritional deficiencies like magnesium or zinc uh, or all the other things we didn't talk about, understanding uh, probiotics, understanding the role of omega-3s and other nutrients, then it makes sense to have a nutritional uh, approach first, set up a biological foundation before medications are even considered. The last thing I want to share with you about nutrition and ADHD is side effects to medications. Many of you who have tried stimulants or kids have tried stimulants know that some of the side effects, particularly irritability, anxiety, um, uh, chewing, picking, ticks, um, any of those side effects are responsive to magnesium supplementation. So a, a, a tick uh, from a stimulant could go away quickly um, with uh, magnesium supplementation. Oftentimes, some of the other side effects, the only side effects that aren't going to disappear would be uh, decreased appetite. So the world that I travel in as an integrated psychiatrist, uh, we're not throwing away our medication as a treatment modality. Uh, we're not saying nutrients are the only answer, but we're also saying that we can do a better job than just um, symptomatic relief with stimulants. We can look at underlying nutritional causes and we can use nutrients to supplement medications when needed. So why don't I stop there? And okay. um, Thank you so much, Dr. Greenblatt. Um, could you um, state the name of your website? I don't believe we, we cited that. Let me make sure uh, we have it. finallyfocusedbook.com. Finallyfocusedbook.com. Uh, okay, terrific. Dr. Greenblatt, what do you recommend that our listeners, whether a, a caregiver or an adult, say to their doctor to best address this topic? What kind of testing should they ask for? What should they What should they say? Well, I think that um, I think pediatricians are much more aware of the role of nutrients, uh, probiotics, and supplements in uh, ADHD. So, so I think the question is is going to be. Are there any um, blood tests that we could look at to see if my child is a deficient in iron, um, has a um, lead uh, or elevated copper, um, B12, zinc? These are all tests that your pediatricians can uh, simply do in okay. the office. So these tests can be done by pediatrician, and, and so it's really up to parents to ask for this. Um, yes. Yeah. Would they, would, would they need to see a specific kind of a, a doctor? Can they expect their, their regular pediatrician or their regular internist to tackle this? I think many pediatricians are, are aware of this information now. I've seen it in Grand Rounds at children's hospitals. Um, there's certainly developmental pediatricians, and there's a very, very um, growing number of holistic, integrative uh, pediatricians. So I think to really... Uh, provide the best care if there is an integrative uh, medical a pediatrician in your area. That's probably where you're going to get the most okay. help if you're looking for nutritional support. Okay, great. 
for those people who are on medication, stimulant medication, or who for whose children are on stimulant medication, they're wondering whether they can just add nutritional supplementation or do they need to start over, restart, um, stop the stimulants, restart? What, how, what's the relationship between the two the treatment, the medication and the um, dietary supplements? Well, uh, there's absolutely no possible side effects. Um, if the child is doing well on a stimulant, I would not stop it. Uh, the, the supplements can be added and uh, nutritional support, magnesium, zinc, all of these things can be added to medication. So I would not stop medication. It's not either or. It's an integrative approach. What you might find for some of these kids, if they're taking medica- uh, supplements for three, six months, they might need less or might not need medicine, but you do not need to stop the medication to start supplements. Okay. Um, so for those parents who whose children are complaining of the um, – side effects of medication, is it possible that, that they they might want to move to a nutritional supplement? Uh, I, again, I would not take anybody off the medication if you're doing better. If someone is having a side effect, if it's uh, appetite, you know, you need to adjust it or, or stop it to a different medicine. But let's say it's irritability or a tick, mm-hmm. uh, then you might try magnesium on top of the medication if you're getting okay. uh, improvement. Great. Um, do you, can you give any guidelines for dosage? There are numerous questions on this question. I'm suspecting that it, it, it may be variable. Um, for none of these nutrients, it's, you know, what used to be termed mega vitamin therapy. So for zinc, uh, usually 15 milligrams twice a day for a uh, child, 30 milligrams twice a day for an adult. Okay. You want to give zinc with food if you take it on an empty stomach you might get a nauseous or a stomachache. Magnesium is around 400 milligrams total during a day, divided uh, twice a day. Uh, So those are kind of guidelines that are safe and appropriate. That's helpful, right. Um, Do you you have, and this is another question that has been asked by many people, can you recommend brands? It's probably difficult to do. There are so many brands and so many variations of of um, zinc, magnesium, so forth? Um, uh, you know, I think um, I, I do recommend brands because quality is important. Right. And some of those in the book. But but the good news is something like zinc, I, I, I think anywhere would be fine. Uh, magnesium, um, I chose that because you can pick that up also any anywhere except for magnesium oxide. Um, okay. For zinc, I'm not as concerned about a brand um, because it's pretty simple, inexpensive supplement. And magnesium is also uh, pretty available um, in the supplements I, I listed, except for oxide. Right. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of interest in um, your thoughts on fish oils, which I think, um, at least we know from attitude from surveying our readers, that fish oil is the, the supplement that most of our readers have tried or have thought to try. What, I know it wasn't part of your core presentation, but can you give your thoughts on fish oils in general? Sure. I mean, I, I was involved in, the, in some of the early research in the 90s, and, and what's often missed is that um, oftentimes kids with ADHD are deficient in fatty acids, um, but some of the better studies looked at omega-3s and omega-6s. Uh, so that's important. Omega-6s is what's in primrose oil. Omega-3s is what's in fish oil. In, in our practice over these years, we actually look at test. We test, so we know who's deficient in fish oil. And I would say that there's a percentage of kids, uh, particularly some of the anxious um, individuals who are deficient in fish oil and would benefit from fish oil. What happens in this nutraceutical world is we kind of think one size fits all. And so if 100 people took fish oil with ADHD, some kids would do better, but not everybody. Okay. The biggest concern I see among parents, though, is that, you know, there's an expression, takes three months to change your oil. Um, so they, and then that means to change the, the fatty acids in the brain. So if you just take the supplement for 30 days and your kid's not doing better, people give up. So it usually is about at least a three-month trial. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So... You know, much in the in the in the in vogue these days is CBD oil, and we do have a number of questions about CBD oil. 
and what, what your thoughts are on its role in treating ADHD? Well, it's a great uh, question. Uh, a CBD, I, I think, is uh, going to be an incredibly useful adjunct to lots of psychiatric um, concerns, anxiety in particular. I have not seen great research on ADHD. Uh, I've seen decent research on anxiety, and we'll use it in the practice. Um, it helps a percentage of individuals. I just can't predict who it'll benefit. Interesting. Uh, I think um, I would take a reputable brand and, and try it for 30 days. It can't hurt, um, but usually you see a response within 30 days. Okay. Coming back to lithium, can you speak a bit about testing and doses and for lithium? Sure. Uh, lithium, um, most of the time, uh, we can get lithium uh, levels due to, uh, from a hair sample, mm -hmm. um, and there's a lab uh, looking at urine levels, and these are norm. But most of the lithium supplementation, we're talking about a very micro dosages, it's based on family history of substance abuse and clinical symptoms of irritability and aggression. Okay. This is a question from someone who would like to know whether adding nutritional lithium would be helpful to someone who's on Zoloft or Prozac. So whether adding, I guess, adding those to SSRIs. Uh, it, it's certainly clinically uh, appropriate. I think a lot of the supplements say not to add them, but it's safe. We do it all the time in traditional psychiatry and integrative psychiatry. They, they work very differently. So nutritional lithium is fine to add to antidepressants. Okay. Okay. You should talk to your doctor before adding lithium. I assume that goes without saying for all of these. Absolutely, yeah. Do you recommend food sensitivity tests? For our young children, let's just say under 12, um, I think food allergy testing is incredibly important. Um, uh, it's how I started my career. I spent uh, uh, a number of months in the uh, allergist's office who was testing for food allergies, and I saw dramatic changes in behavior. Um, so wow, when I have these really? four or five, yes, uh, Marshall Mandel, um, and uh, these four or five, six year olds, irritable, hyperactive. Um, I encourage everyone to look up uh, Doris Rapp, who wrote about this in the 80s. She was an allergist. Um, what I haven't found as much success with is with adults um, and, and looking at food allergy testing. But for our young children, uh, sometimes eliminating a food, and people uh, focus on dairy and wheat, but sometimes some of these food sensitivities could be to healthy foods, tomatoes or grapes or uh, other kinds of foods. So for young children under 12, food allergy testing um, is important. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, I think that um, Sandy Newmark, who who has spoken here at Attitude a number of times, always recommends starting out with an elimination diet. He says he sees tremendous impact on his patients. So that's confirming what you're saying. Um, what about sugar, the role of sugar, which, you know, I, I, we hear different comments on on sugar and, and, and um, artificial flavorings as well. Yeah, I, I think um, when I started talking about ADHD nutrition, you know, my only slide I had was, you know, a pediatric study saying sugar did not affect ADHD. And that was 30 years ago. Now, now we have um, clear research, you know, supporting the role, particularly of sugar sweetened beverages, um, the sodas. So we know that a high sugar refined diet affects behavior, affects ADHD. We can correlate behavioral symptoms with how many sugar sweetened beverages kids eat during the day. So I think the literature is quite clear now. Um, uh, it doesn't mean, uh, uh, you know, driving our children crazy, eliminating all sugar. It means being conscious of refined sugar uh, affecting some kids more than others. I call um, refined sugar, you know, kind of a nutritional vacuum cleaner because besides the blood sugar regulation, it depletes other nutrients, uh, certainly important B vitamins like B6. But sugar has been shown to correlate with behavior problems. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's really, it's really new it just in the time that we've been working on at Attitude, which is now almost 20 years. Certainly 10 years ago, we were saying, you know, there was no real proof, but that definitely seems to have changed at this point. Um, a number of people are asking if you have a recommended supplement for OPC or a brand that you recommend. 
Yeah, there's a um, brand um, from Pure Encapsulation called, um, and, and they just put it into a, a stick so kids can take it. It's called, um, and, and I think it should be in the book, so it's curcumine sorb. So it is a concentrated source of um, OPCs uh, from green tea, grapeseed, and pycnogenol. I didn't mention uh, pine bark was the, the original sources and most of the research on ADHD. So it's um, from a company called Pure Encapsulations Curcumine Sorb. C-U-R-C-U-M-S-O-R-B-M-I-N-D, curcumine sorb. Curcumine sorb. Okay, great. Thank you. That it will make a number of people who are listening and happy. Um, Angie is a newly diagnosed adult who has not yet tried medication. Do you recommend that she ask her psychiatrist for nutritional testing before starting medication? Uh, you know, I think the sad reality is a traditional psychiatrist is not going to be able to respond to that at all. Uh -huh. um, and I think that um, there, uh, for adults anyway, so there's going to be a subset of psychiatrists that would look at uh, nutrition. So I, I think I would sort out a, a nutritional-oriented um, psychiatrist. There's a web, there's a group called Integrative Medicine for Mental Health, IMMH, and they have a listing of um, mental health um, professionals, psychiatrists in every state. So that might be a, a resource. Uh, that's good. That's a good point. So look, look specifically before you start down that road for, to make sure your psychiatrist is familiar with integrative medicine practices. Coming back to copper in water, who would test for copper and what should kids drink? There's concern among our listeners that you know, recommending to their children that they drink water may not actually have turned out to be a wise recommendation. Well, certainly the, the tragedy, and actually, it was, besides Flint, uh, I think New Jersey um, and uh, Detroit, a number of other cities, and the Massachusetts study was quite glaring on the front page of the paper, but um, so they had to block off all the water fountains. So I think, um, uh, you know, bottled water has its own concern, uh, but at least we, we know that some of the copper is gone. Uh, you can test for copper for hair. Hair testing is the most accurate. Uh, but okay. I think it's pretty cheap, and also a most you can get your water tested for copper. Um, some places do it for free, otherwise it's a very small um, amount. Okay. Um, do you see a difference in the effectiveness of OPCs for children versus adults with ADHD? Uh, no. Again, it's one of the few supplements I've been using consistently for 30 years. So we've used it in – I don't use it in young children, but I've certainly used it in school-age kids and adults. And for years, it was um, uh, OPCs and rhodiola. So, uh, someone asked a question about rhodiola. Those were my two supplements I would use for adults with ADHD that didn't want medication. So that combination has a, a very good um, success rate. Okay. Does cooking, oh, it's a question, interesting question. Does cooking in copper pots add copper to food? I don't, I doubt it, right? I, I think some of the newer copper pots don't, at least the way they're advertised, um, but I'm not sure about older, older pots. Okay, yeah, true. A uh, question about folate deficiency in ADHD. Is that a concern? Yeah, I mean, one of the challenging parts about coming up with an hour webinar and why we needed to write the book is because everybody's different and not everyone right. has the same nutritional deficiencies. But absolutely, there are individuals that have genetic difficulties metabolizing uh, folate, and there's a subset of kids that ADHD is related to that genetic difference, and supplemental supplementation with folate can be helpful. Okay. A popular herb is turmeric. And there's a question here asking whether turmeric helps increase brain function. Uh, yes, a, a curcumin is, is the, the phytochemical in, in the turmeric, and, um, and that's in our OPC products that we recommend. And uh, there's pretty good research on both depression and not as much directly on ADHD, but a very powerful a nutrient that uh, has very significant effects on brain chemistry. So turmeric, uh, curcumin, uh, if taken with uh, fat, can be incredibly helpful. Okay. Beth is asking, says your original research was, was done with isotonics, OPC3. Is there a reason you don't recommend that? 
That was a particular brand, um, a brand. Okay. that we, we used in the, in the 1990s. So since then, we've been using um, many sources of OPCs. Um, there's, there's nothing wrong with that uh, isotonic. Um, that's just their name. But what we have found is the most important thing is, uh, and that's why the multiple sources of OPCs together. So just taking grapeseed extract might be helpful. Taking pine bark might be helpful. But com- combination, uh, we, we got more robust uh, responses. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Um, let's see. We have maybe one more question. I have to pick one here on sweeteners and sugar. Um, do you distinguish between artificial sweeteners, re- refined sweeteners? Um, is there uh, a distinction in your mind between the, the high fructose corn syrup between the, and, and, and the kinds of sugars that are consumed and, and their negative impact? Well, uh, good question. Since you brought up high fructose corn syrup, uh, you know, uh, I will, a lot of my work is with eating disorders and the relationship between eating disorders and ADHD, uh, particularly in our young girls who uh, are not hyperactive and, and food and impulsive eating starts early on. So in our ADHD um, eating disorder population, high fructose corn syrup, I think, is a very a deadly, dangerous combination. So that I, is one of my most concerning sweeteners. I try to eliminate that. The artificial sweeteners, one, has been shown to not help with weight and weight loss and probably can aggravate it and affect the microbiome. And uh, certainly we talked about the sugar-sweetened beverages um, and the high refined sugar-affecting behavior. So I guess, um, you know, our grandmothers were right in talking about moderation. Small amounts is probably harmless, but these high amounts of refined sugar will affect behavior, and more so in some individuals than others. Okay, great. Um, last uh, clarification point before we end. Um, when, you're, when we're referring to ADHD throughout this discussion, this also um, incorporates an attentive variant, sometimes called ADD, Correct. There are some people who are wondering whether there's a distinction. There often is a distinction, but not in the information that I mentioned. I think for our attention kids, uh, inattentive kids and adults, the OPCs, the rhodiola um, can be very helpful. For the hyperactive, aggressive kids, that's where we're often using uh, zinc to bring down copper, uh, nutritional lithium, and um, magnesium has been helpful for both subtypes. Okay, that's super helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Greenblatt. This was fascinating. We're so grateful for your time. And to everyone, have a great year. And we'll see you back here at Attitudes ADHD Expert Webinar Series. Thanks. Thank you. For more Attitude podcasts and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com.